Hi, thank you everyone for joining us for DDU teaching or advanced echo teaching this week. It's a pleasure to have Kylie Baker back from Ipswich Hospital. Kylie's a wonderful emergency physician, uh, an extremely experienced operator with ultrasound, and it's uh, an absolute pleasure to have her back teaching us about uh, ultrasound and trauma. Thank you, Kylie. Over to you. Thanks, Sam. I'll just hit the share screen button. Um, I'm really grateful to be asked back. Have you seen my uh, intro slide? We've got it. Thank you. Good. Yeah, this is essentially my conflicts of interest slide across at the right and everything sort of taking second place now to babysitting the granddaughter. Uh, the other thing I want to acknowledge right at the beginning is how hard it is for all you folk down south and having to put off the DDU exams, I reckon that's a, a huge load for people. And uh, I'll understand if you just want to, to run away and, and cry at some stage, um, I'll be perfectly understanding. Anyway, um, I'm going to talk for half an hour, I hope not too much, on the fast scan. And let's uh, just take a minute to understand where it came from. It actually originated to supplant um, diagnostic peritoneal lavage. And it came in before we had rapid CT. So when it was um, assessed initially, it was against DPL. And it was done in, mostly in the United States with fit, young, unstable patients from their motor vehicle trauma. That is patients who weren't wearing seat belts in unregistered cars without helmets uh, going right through the window. So in general, the people that were scanned were fit and healthy prior to their scanning. And that's one of the reasons I think that it had such a good rap to begin with. Now, this is one of my earlier scans from back in 2006. And when we had a picture of this sort of quality, we were really thrilled. We, we got excited with a picture like this. Uh, here's another one. This is a positive um, longitudinal uh, pouch of Douglas scan. And I could really understand people <laughs> who wouldn't be enthused by something like this. Um, 10 years later, that same picture looks much, much more clear and exciting and interesting. You can even see the sort of folds around the um, cervix. But why bother when you can get such a marvelous um, sort of high res CT scan in only um, a very few minutes? Well, um, there has been a fairly recent Cochrane review on the usefulness of point of care ultrasound or EFAST scanning. And um, it's a nice and fair review, I think. And essentially the conclusion is that EFAST is not really recommended in every patient. And the review does say that it is really a good second line study in places where you can't get a rapid CT. So they're talking about mass casualty situations, um, uh, places with decreased resources. More importantly, uh, I think they say that it's even less use in children. Um, in adults, you have a fair specificity, but not such a good sensitivity. So you can't rule out free fluid. And of course, that's what we want to do. In children, you can't rule out or rule in because they normally have a little bit of free fluid in the pelvis. So technically, I'm not really going to be reaching for my ultrasound probe in your average um, run of the mill garden type trauma. The one thing I think that bears um, tribute though in this um, Cochrane review is that although the abdominal portion of the EFAS is not terribly sensitive and specific, the um, thorax, the chest views for pneumothorax or hemothorax have specificities and sensitivities in the high 90s. And so although it has the usual caveat of further research is required, um, it may still be um, very valuable to do the chest portion of the EFAS scan in a multi-trauma. Anyway, um, why do we teach it then when it's really so um, such a little um, output? And I think at least in our place here where we were on trauma bypass for a while, we use it a lot for off-label indications and that's specifically early pregnancy. I mean, Steph scored a couple of ruptured topics on the night shift. And that is, I think, our biggest value for money for an EFAS scan. Um, it certainly adjusts our paracentesis and pleurocentesis positions, and even sometimes when we attempt it. Um, 
You can use it to look for things, complications post-surgery, collections, ruptures, um, and that's not technically what an EFAS should be for, but I think we certainly get some good value from it then. Now, some people have thought about using it for risk stratification on low risk patients. And my view of this is that if it's something that makes you do serial abdominal exams, it makes you go back and actually see the patient, actually lay a hand on the patient, then yes, it's a value and I'm going to support it. Anyway, I think you need to know fast scans for um, the DDU. So I'm going to look through the classical teaching and show you what the windows are and where we're looking for the fluid. And then I want to get into some of the subtleties and about it. I've got half a dozen cases. And if we don't get through the last one, it's no great tragedy. The other thing about um, doing a fast scan is, is it's an introduction to the windows to the abdomen. In other words, where we put the scan for looking for free fluid is a place where there is not usually much gas. It's a place where there's often a sort of a nice um, bit of liver or a bit of bladder that we can look through. And when we do say the right upper quadrant, you have to be able to identify liver, gallbladder, IVC, right kidney. When you do the left, left upper quadrant, you have to be able to identify spleen, uh, jejunum, can't see what else is under there. Um, and when you look down in the suprapubic view, you have to be able to recognize bladder, rectum, uterus, fetus, ileum, colon. And so even though they're not part of your fast scan, you become very familiar with these in fit normal people just by doing your EFAST scan. Now in trauma, um, it did start off as a FAST, which was purely abdominal. And then they added the subcostal view for um, uh, pericardial effusion. And then they added the lung views, high point and low point, which um, uh, why we call it EFAST, extended FAST. So the right upper quadrant view is the first view we tend to look for. And if you're able to include the right lung base in the same picture, that's really handy. It's no shame, however, having to get two separate pictures. We do the left upper quadrant and it looks almost the same, liver and spleen very similar and right kidney, left kidney very similar. This is why labeling is important. We do the suprapubic view and we have to do two suprapubic views, transverse and long. The reason being that the midline, the bladder, um, sits on top of the rectum or the uterus and the peritoneum reflects. And so part of the bladder is retroperitoneal. And what this means is fluid tends to track sideways down into the adnexa right and left. So that's where we have to look. It's not a matter of looking directly behind the bladder. We want to look at the highest point of the right lung. Now, Something that we all automatically do is we go and put the probe in the lung apex because that's the lung apex. But if you think about it, these are trauma patients, so they'll be lying supine. So the highest point of the lung is actually going to be parasternal as low as you can go right, uh, right next to the sternum. Um, do the same on the left side. And of course, the cardiac view. I'm not going to even touch the cardiac views because you guys can do them and you sleep right or left-handed upside down. But I'm going to look at the first five views. Any questions so far or comments? No, I think you're doing a great job. Keep crack on. Okay, so our classic right upper quadrant view is this. We want the mid-gray liver. We want the nice mid-gray kidney. Excuse the little renal cyst there. And if you can possibly get a tiny bit of this diaphragmatic um, angle at the, on the screen left, that is really good. Now the places we're looking for the fluid is uh, in a shape like this. We're looking for a bit above the liver or superficial to the liver. We really have to look at the lowermost tip of the liver. And we look about three quarters of the way along the kidney. It's important to realize that free fluid doesn't track to the upper pole or the lower pole of the kidney because that lies under a mesentery. More on that later. And of course there at the bottom left hand corner that's where we're looking for our hemothorax. Now the, the left upper quadrant looks fairly similar but the view will almost always be a little bit more posterior and a little bit more superior. And in this one although the picture looks the same the peritoneal reflections are a little bit different. So in this particular view 
what we actually want is to spend a bit more time looking superior to the spleen, between the spleen and the diaphragm, much more time focusing on the lower pole of the spleen and less time diving in between the spleen and the kidney because the, because the peritoneal reflections, fluid does not tend to track right down between the spleen and the kidney ever so near so much. Now with the suprapubic views, we need two. And um, we're actually going to be wanting to look to the sides of them, not directly deep to them. Directly deep, we're going to have seminal vesicles in a male, uh, cervix or vaginal stripe in a female, and then that, that hyperechoic curve in the middle of the screen, sort of three quarters of the way down, is the rectal gas shadow. When we turn longitudinally to do a suprapubic view, it's the same sort of thing. Remember, part of the bladder is retroperitoneal, so fluid only collects in these sorts of areas above the or to the left of the um, green line. So our lung views. Now in the old days, we put the M mode on and the M mode, as you know, to, to um, demonstrate that there was more movement underneath the pleural line to above. And if you don't have much storage space on your machine, that's still a good way to go. But there's a lot of false negatives and false positives you can get on M mode. So if you can possibly save a clip, that's actually better. Now, I'm going to go through a lot of pictures to, because you know how useful pictures are. And we're going to start with the ideal case. Young chap assaulted with a baseball bat. Okay, so that one, absolutely no prizes for seeing the free fluid on that one. But already you can see something that doesn't quite match with what I said in that we can sort of see the black fluid tracking to the left of the kidney, um, almost as if it's almost going down to the diaphragm. And I've just said that that doesn't happen. Does anyone want to suggest why it may be doing this in this picture? It's a bit of a nasty question, but I can nominate if you want. Look at the kidney specifically. So what's happening here is that people are turning the probe, um, what's the word, um, to slice through the kidney in transverse rather than the kidney in long. This is a really tempting thing to do because it's easier to see the kidney like this. But what it means is we're not actually seeing the upper pole of the kidney, we're seeing the side of the kidney. If so you're, you're, not, the, 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 you're slicing the patient sort of in an axial rotation more than yes. at an angle. Yes, that's what I mean. I couldn't think of the word. I knew it wasn't coronal and it wasn't sigital, <laughs> it's axial. Yeah, and, and um, it's fine if you've got free fluid in this view, you don't need to go searching, but you can't rule out free fluid when you're slicing the kidney tangentially like this, unless you fan right to the upper pole. So the reason we know this is somewhat axial is that the pulmonary hilum is sort of diving off to the screen right underneath the um, bowel gas. And so that makes you a little bit suspicious that this may actually be a tangential view rather than longitudinal. In this case though, it's moot point because it's got so much free fluid that um, we don't need to check the upper pole. Okay, now this is the spleen. What do you think about this view? Um, Hatem, can I ask you how to improve this view? So that would require uh, to scan from a little bit above. So yes, go it's good. One, yes. One, round, one deep space above. Yes. And maybe direct the, the beam a little bit more anteriorly. Excellent. And what will happen when we do that? So that would be giving us the chance to see the linear renal angle uh, and the space between the kidney and the, and the spleen. Beautiful answer. So this beam is actually directed down and we're seeing, what is that in there, Hatton? That area there. So that pretty much would be the hilum of the spleen or the lower pole. Yes, yeah, that's true. And you can see it coming in and out. And the fuzzy gray stuff is the stomach. So. What happens is we often see stomach gas down here. 
But sometimes we see a fluid filled stomach and people will mistake this area for free fluid. I've got a picture of that later, but it's not. If you're seeing that, it means as Hatton says, you've got to direct the beam a little more anteriorly because we need to be seeing the kidney in the view like this. Okay, Hatton, is that positive or negative, do you reckon? Uh, that looks negative. I can't see any free fluid anywhere. Mm. And what about whoops, that area there? Any comments? Uh, so I can't really see the contour of the uh, upper pole of the spleen, but I'd like mm. to obtain further view to mm. clarify. It. There is possibility that there could be a laceration with a little bit of hyperdense. Yes. Uh, so I would like to confirm with different view, but there is no free fluid that I can identify. Mm. Now, I'm not sure, and I was saying to Sam that uh, my image quality might not be good enough to go over the net. I'm suspecting there's a tiny, tiny whisker of free fluid at the lower pole of the spleen. But what you did right, that's a splenic laceration. And anything where the spleen loses its even, even echo texture and becomes um, an odd outline, and same thing with kidneys, is a real um, marker for um, solid organ damage. Now, of course, an EFAST is not meant to do solid organ damage, but occasionally you'll come across it and you need to know what to think. Uh, can I ask a quick question about the machine that you're using here? Is this a big high-end machine or is this like the no. venue R2, the point of care one? Yes, this is a point of care one. It's as good They're as awesome. I'm allowed. Nice pictures, aren't they? Sorry? Nice pictures. I'm only showing you the skinny patients yet. <laughs> you wait. <laughs> now, uh, longitudinally, what do you think about this one? Who else have we got here? Uh, just had them. Oh, who's, yep. who's on cool. fire? Okay. Anyway. Jamal is with us as well. Uh, Jamal is doing the critical care DDU. He's an anaesthetist, a very experienced anaesthetist. But Jamal, do, do you, have you done a lot of general ultrasound? Uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm tucked away in theatre today, just trying to. I, I don't do a lot of e-fast. No, I need to, but I don't. So. Are we okay. able to ask you questions, or are you stuck in theatre with patients? Are you okay to talk? Uh, the second one, I'm afraid. Uh, no problem. No problem. Okay, okay. So it looks like it's a pelvic uh, free fluid just on the left side of the of the urinary bladder. Excellent, Hatton. Perfect. And that's the bladder there. Now, why is the free fluid not black? Uh, because likely that there will be some blood associated with it as well. So Excellent. And you can see how the blood is precipitating um, down with gravity and so that we tend to see this gradation of cells excellent now fanning through the bladder in transverse looks a bit weird um, the bladder is that dark bit there the prostate's immediately below it and the rectal gas shadow below that so no free fluid down there at all but there is the sort of the um, big ears up the top right and top left which are the free fluid over the top of the bladder and again, here is the free fluid. You actually see the blood swirling there. And what do you reckon that white hyperechoic arc right in the middle of the screen is? That would be the rectum. Beautiful, excellent. I had him, I'm gonna to have to start asking Steph, you got all the answers right, uh, full on. Anyway. The you've got, you've got me and you've got Louise here as well. You can hassle us. Uh, yeah, I don't want to show Louise you. Louise is doing a DDU next year. Okay, Louise, you're fair game then. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so the most important take home messages from this very straightforward case is that not all fresh blood is black. Well, you guys know that from Echo. Cells layer out. Um, the bladder is partly retroperitoneal. So you need to be looking to the sides and the top, not underneath the bladder. And be wary of the position of the stomach because just about everyone mistakes a, a full stomach for free fluid at some stage in their life, even my friends as sonographers. I did put in a couple of bonus pictures of ruptured spleens. Just as a um, reference point, your spleen should be roughly the same size as the kidney. So when the spleen looks like double the size of the kidney, you need to be asking why. And when it appears to have layers like this, um, this is actually a spontaneous rupture of the spleen, atraumatic, and it's basically bled gradually out and out, expanding the capsule. 
Okay, now that was the easy one. Going to get for a harder one now to look at where tiny bits of fluid collect. This is a young man with right upper quadrant pain. He got assaulted three days before uh, with kicks and punches to his abdomen. He's a pretty tough fellow with, um, uh, you'll see, really good abdominal musculature. He's had worsening abdominal pain, but particularly in the right upper quadrant overnight. And he's hemodynamically stable for the four hours he spent on our ramp area. But his abdomen is tense and guarded. So uh, lung. Louise, any comments on the lung? Is the image good enough to see? We're looking obviously for a pneumothorax here. We can see the rib shadows and looking between the ribs, I can't see any sliding and I can see a line. So there is quite likely to be a pneumothorax. Oh no, that means I haven't got good enough image quality. Uh, I was afraid of that. You've got to peer at it very closely, but I can see sliding on my screen, but if you can't, then that's my problem. It's coming through pretty pretty slow to send them a friend. No, the frame rate's okay. down a bit, sorry. Uh, well, can I ask a second question there? Why is it that we can see the pleural line almost continually under the ribs? Um, shouldn't it be dropping out because it, sound waves don't go through calcium? Is, is it not a side lobe artifact or a... Nope. This means that we're going through the cartilaginous portion of the rib. Ah, uh, yes. And what is really good about that is it means we've got the probe in the right place. You mean it's in on the top, the, the, the top point? Yes, that's right, exactly. The highest point, the lower anterior chest. Yeah, and so... When I see someone looking for pneumothorax and through cartilaginous ribs, I'm quite reassured that they've got the probe in the right place. They've got it sort of parasternal at the lower, lower ribs. Uh, that's, that's the take on point from that one. This was one of my even harder scans. I was trying to make it lighter for you. Uh, the question being, do you think there's any hemothorax? And uh, You'll have to make an educated guess because if you couldn't see the sliding on the last one, this might be worse. Any comments? I think you've got a, a fluid filled space at the back there, haven't you? Why do you say that? It's almost like you can see the diaphragm right. that suddenly yeah. appears when you get the when they're taking a breath in, and then there's almost like a, you can see their ribs behind. Ah, nah, ha, yeah. Now, also see the spine behind. We're certainly seeing the diaphragm, yes, no questions. The spine looks a bit different to that. And this is, I reckon this is actually a really hard thing to do, to pick fluid in that costophrenic recess when it's always going to be dark anyway. Yeah. But all I can say, I've got some pictures later, when you do see the spine, it's really obvious is the first thing. The second thing is, see, it's almost like little tiny icicles of, of comet tail artifact off the, that diaphragmatic curve in the lower mid screen. That's an indication of air in there, not fluid. So when you do get um, fluid there, that curve of the diaphragm becomes really sharp and clean rather than uh, dribbly like this. But I've got some pictures of that later for you. Oh, we did Okay, now this is another one you may have to peer very closely. This is the left upper, uh, left lower anterior chest. Again, we've got cartilaginous ribs. Hi, Lewis, can you see any sliding there? Hi, Carly. I. Not really. I mean, you can see A lines. Oh, damn. That means and... my images aren't good enough. They're, pre they're pretty slow, um, but uh, but I can definitely see A lines and I think I can see a B line cutting through some of the A lines at the right hand side of the screen. Oh, well, if you've got a B line, we can say no pneumothorax. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now this is, I, I thought this might be an issue with the sliding. It shouldn't be such a problem with the others. This is the left lung base and it's even harder to see diaphragm on the left lung base because the spleen is not as big. And so it doesn't form a window for you. So you've really got to hold your mouth in the right place to see the diaphragmatic curve on this view. 
All right, let's start with the money shots now because he's kicked in the abdomen. What do you reckon about this, positive or negative? Negative. Mm -hmm. Any others? I'd like to see the liver tip all the way down. Yeah. In actual fact, we've got a tiny, like tiny oh. bit of fluid, really little at the end of the liver tip on the far screen right. Nice. Yeah, not nice. Scary, scary. Um, Only anything on the uh, upper pole of the kidney? Yes. Uh, no, nothing on the upper pole of the kidney. This is it a little bit more closely sort of. Can you see it there yet, Sam? Is that good Got enough? It. Got it, yeah. Yeah, tiny, isn't it? Tiny. But makes it a positive fast. Um, let's look at the spleen. Um, remember, it's the lower pole of the spleen where the, the fluid first goes. Again, really tiny. And all you get the impression is something moving in a tiny bit of black. Look at these abs. This is his super. Oh, this is cardiac view. You guys know cardiac. I'm not going to spend time on cardiac. This is um, transverse through his bladder. Now, see that little dark strip yeah. just beneath the, the circle of the bladder? What do you reckon that is? Free fluid. Sorry? Free fluid. No, it's not. And then, oh, so you can't see my screen. Uh, on the right, top right. Oh, top right. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Sorry, that is free fluid, definitely. I was saying little black strip like a moustache underneath the bladder. What do you reckon that is? Ah, excuse me. Oh, poo. Well, <laughs> the poo is the white bit underneath, yeah. The black bit is the seminal vesicles. Oh. So uh, oh. you mustn't mistake that little sort of black shaped moustache or bow tie sitting under the bladder because like I said earlier, Lewis, I think you missed this. Uh, the base of the bladder is retroperitoneal. So free fluid doesn't go down there. But Sam, you're dead right. That's free fluid in the top spring right. Uh, and longitudinally, so this is the midline bladder. You really have to have an eye of faith on that one. But when you scan a little bit to the side, you can just see a little bit more there. Yeah. So this is him. Do you reckon you'd have picked that? She's is small, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It turns out that it, when he went to theatre, this was bile. So he'd actually oh, wow. ruptured from the, um, from the assault. Mm. Anyway, uh, the reason... It's I not a... I was just going to say, it's not a huge amount of free fluid um, there on the CT, though. So that's um, a good pickup by ultrasound. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I wanted you to see what a really barely positive one looked like. Um, yeah, but he was a thin young man. It actually wasn't so hard when you're right there. And the gallbladder wall was thick too. Um, anyway. Now, um, oh, I've got to keep an eye on the time. This is a young man who walked in after a car accident, single vehicle. He drove into a tree. He got out. He went home, but he was a bit sore, so he came into hospital. Nurse took a look at him and gave him a chest x-ray form and said, um, walk around to x-ray and when you come back, show us the picture. Had a bit of right-sided chest pain. Um, Lewis, can you comment on the chest x-ray? Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it looks like a, as you'd probably hope, a... Um, uh, relatively normal looking chest x-ray i can't see any significant uh pneumothorax there um the this is clearly the right side the apex looks a little bit um a little bit uh hypo dense so i i'd probably want to see that a little bit closer than my thumbnail but um there's no there's no large pneumothorax mm -hmm. good anything else um can't see any broken ribs, can't see any broken clavicles, can't see any subcutaneous air. Um, Metastinum looks normal. I so right. I'm going to say no, it looks pretty normal um, from a thumbnail. Yep, good. 
Now, um, uh, just please forgive me. I was looking for some of my pictures that were cardiology orientation, but this is an old case, so it's the other. If someone's using a curvy linear probe, I think you can probably assume that they're using general sonography orientation, meaning that the patient head will be to the screen right or the patient lungs. If people are using a um, cardiac probe, I think you might like to assume that the patient's head is to the screen right and the, um, their breathing, the respiration goes from right to left. But these are the four views that we use sort of traditionally um, one, two, three, and four. Everyone disagrees on what we call them. Um, so I won't even try. <laughs> I'll just talk about high point and low point. Now this is his good lung. I always like to have a little bit of heart in it, but I took them as stills because it costs less in terms of um, uh, storage space. Take my word for it, that was normal. But we're gonna look at the, the bad side now, the right side. He's got a little bit of chest pain here. So uh, first view, Hatem, this is the right apex. Okay, so there are A lines, it's a uh, uh, seashore sign is lost here. So this means that there is no lung sliding. Excellent. Does that mean there's a pneumothorax? Uh, no, it's not 100% pathognomonic. So... Beautiful answer, beautiful answer. It's likely, but there are other things that can cause this. Okay, what about that one? So that... that's a seashore sign. Yeah. And that means that there's lung sliding in this area. Yes, good. What about that? This is in the armpit, essentially, mid-axillary line high in the axilla. So there are few B lines that I can identify, which means that definitely there is no pneumothorax there. Uh, and why would he be having B lines? Uh, so it could be for many, many different things. It could be some fluid overload, could be consolidation. So. Specifically in this case, the most mm -hmm. likely cause? Oh, and here's the lung base too. Um, so specifically in this case, with his context, uh, whether he received any fluid restoration, whether there's any aspiration that happened at any stage. Okay, well, hold that thought, hold that thought. Now, obviously the next thing to do is get a CT scan, but if you can't, for resource reasons, what we can do is double down to the linear probe. This is medial. And I suppose if you're having trouble with the thumbnails, you won't see, but there's no sliding medially. Laterally, um, we've got definite sliding and some B lines coming in there, I think. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. And this is when you connect the two, when you slide in the rib space between the pneumothorax on the screen left and the B lines on the screen right, we've got the lung point. Does anyone can't see the lung point? No, it's good. It's good? Yeah. Okay. So, whoops, trying to click forward. This is his CT scan. Mm. Essentially a small anterior pneumothorax, a nice contusion, which was the word I was looking for yep. uh, posteriorly, and no free fluid. And we actually, I meant to point it out, but there was no free fluid in the costophrenic reason, costophrenic <laughs> By the way, Kelly, the chest X ray was actually showing uh, uh, pneumothorax. It was, I know, but poor old yeah. Lewis has just got a small screen. And um, uh, it, and honestly, only about 50% of people see that pneumothorax. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm on, I'm on my phone, but. Um, that's that's uh, marvelous uh, dedication, <laughs> Lewis. <laughs> um, I said there's no big pneumothorax. Um, and you did the... say it was hypoechoic, so you were on the mark. The CT showed some pneumatoceles there. Did you um, did you notice anything on ultrasound? Uh, no, I didn't at the time. It was mm. several years back, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't even know what happened in the end. Um, the learning points from this, the things that are important to remember, is that even if you do pick a pneumothorax, you won't know how deep it is. You won't know if it's two millimetres or two centimetres or 20 centimetres. Um, because it all looks the same. You can plot the surface area, but uh, why bother if you're going to get a CT? Um, and if you do have a complete pneumothorax, meaning there's no point, no lung point, no B lines anywhere, I think the next thing to do is to immediately check the heart function, the venous return, rather than send him to CT. 
Uh, just for those people who need a refresher, pneumothorax on the screen right, lung sliding on the screen left. Very subtle. Um, people who say to me, I only do lung scanning for pneumothorax, it really scares me because to me, that's actually the hardest and most subtle of the signs. Um, with the most uh, traps for new players. Now this one, Hatton, what do you think this is? It's lung or it's chest wall anyway. It's chest wall, it's not deep enough. It's just up to 3.5 centimeter. Uh, uh, that's, I can't really clearly see a rip shadow out of that, but looks like it's just one intercostal space that's being scanned and intermittently getting one rib on top and one rib below. Um, I can't see any A-lines. Mm -hmm. Probably there is one big A-line. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is subcutaneous emphysema. Yes. And it's a that damn is, yeah. nuisance because you get it in people with rib fractures and pneumothoraces. Mm -hmm. And what it means is that you then can't see down to the lungs. But yes. people do talk about milking it out of the way, and sometimes you can do that, but you're dead right when you said you're looking for the lung, or the ribs, and because mm. you pick your subcutaneous emphysema by finding the ribs, whether it's above or below. Yeah. But it, yeah. Sorry, Haddon, what? No, no, I, I just had seen a few of these uh, similar pictures whenever I'm looking for abdomen. So uh -huh. whenever I'm looking for intestinal perforation, uh-huh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'd see similar images. And yeah. even for routine post-operative patients, any laparotomy, post-laparotomy, I'd see similar uh, yeah, pictures. And, yes, and particularly the post-laparoscopy too, because they have the yeah, free exactly. gas, yeah. What about this one? So this, this is, is the right, lung base. right lung base. Right lung base, there's... It looks like it's a dynamic air bronchogram. Mm -hmm. So there is a bit of effusion. Yes. Uh, at least mild to moderate, probably moderate. Uh, I'd give it um, maybe one liter nearly. Mm -hmm. And there's a long tail coming, coming and going. I think it's mainly looks like lung atlexis rather than um, mm -hmm. consolidation. Okay, now this is where I think it's really important to figure which is the patient head in. This is yes. a curvy linear probe, so we're probably using general sonography where the patient's head will be the screen left, which means that shouldn't be lung on the right side of the screen. Lung should be coming, respiration should be originating on our screen left. Yes, but yeah, it depends on which probe you're using, which probe orientation you're having. And um, again, this is something probably lost in the translation, but that edge of white on the right is not actually sliding. There's no movement to it at all. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, this, this is yeah, a hemonumous like Again, another. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is a, a lung, um, a hydro not point, they point. call it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, but sorry, I've got a maybe got to use the DICOM images, I think. Um, this one, Sam, what's odd about these pictures? <laughs> Apart from the fact they're very poor gecko pictures. <laughs> it... I think Sam is not there. It's, oh, uh, Sam, Louise, mm. do you want to say something odd about these pictures? Maybe they're having an evacuation. It's pretty odd to see an air signature anterior to the RV inflow tract, isn't it? The RV. I can't remember. Sorry, I forgot to unmute. There seems to be something sitting in front of the RV. That Perfect. Looks, yes, Louise. Uh, it looks kind of solid. Yeah. It's actually, I can't remember if this particular one was a pneumothorax or a pneumomediastinum. Uh, but you see the air signature right the very near field of the screen with a little bit of an A line. It appears to have movement to it. So that's very, um, the word deceptive. But I do know the patient had the abnormalities. 
Okay, I better keep moving. A 10-year-old boy with a handlebar to the right upper quadrant. Stoic child, normal observation. So he got sent to our ambulatory care where our trainee was doing some practice scans. Um, the lungs, I think, will slip through the lungs. Sliding on the left. On the right here, do you reckon that's a lung point? Hatham, I've probably got to ask you because this will be hard for Lewis on his phone. So it looks like the rest of the lung is actually sliding. Yeah. So I won't so think that this would be a lung point as such. Uh, there are A lines in the part of the lung that we can see here, but yeah. probably there could be. Uh, what do you think that the, is on the screen right? Bearing in mind this is the left lower anterior chest. What's on the screen right? On the screen right, uh, so on the screen right, yeah, so that's the apical part of the left lung that looks like oh. L1. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have labeled it apical, sorry. Okay, sorry. So that's L2? Yes. Okay, so that's just the heart coming. Uh, yes, perfect. A lot of people mistake the anterior border of the lung where it goes across the heart as a lung point. Um, this is a, one of those traps for new players. Um, pneumothorax should be white into white, not white into dark. I oh, don't worry about the heart. You guys know that. Okay. Um, this will be a bigger picture. Pre-fluid, yes or no? Louise? Sorry, I'm muting. Uh the, oh, no, hang on, what? No, yes, it is free fluid. Excellent, good. Above the kidney. Yes, exactly. Um, this is the spleen. No, I can't see anything there. Very gray. Okay, now this is the pelvis of this child. What do you think? Um, this is a good big one for you, Lewis. What's gone to? Okay, Louise, free, any? Free fluid lying beside the bladder on both sides. Exactly, exactly. But remember, children often have free fluid in the pelvis, a small amount. I did ask my friends on Twitter um, how much is too much, and they couldn't give me an answer. But they did say when it's particulate like this, then it is definitely bad. Uh, this kitty had a, a liver, liver lack in the end. but. Um, Particulate free fluid in a child is definitely bad. That's the bladder there. Um, children, again, we shouldn't be doing an e-fast in children as a first test or even as a second test. The diagnostic accuracy doesn't warrant an e-fast. But yeah, this, this one was a, quite a surprise to all included. Now, one of the traps for new players, this is a longitudinal view of the pelvis. We've got the pubic symphysis on the screen right. On your first glance, this looks a bit like a bladder. In an actual fact, this is an older lady and the bladder is nearly empty and sagging because the perineal floor sags. And what we're seeing is actually free fluid above the bladder. But if you're looking at it from a long way away, you might not realize that was free fluid. Okay. Now, this is a, obviously um, a possible ectopic. I'm going to rush through this one because I want to get to another slide. Obviously positive there. Uh, this is right up a quadrant. Sam, positive or negative? Yeah, good. Now, the reason this one's interesting, this is the left upper quadrant, and I think it shows you the way the fluids is distributed differently in the left upper quadrant. It's more to the lower pole of the spleen and above, and it's not going down around the kidney. Now, this is what's scary about young women with ectopics is um, when you actually get down into the pelvis, things look very, very strange. Uh, that, by the way, that little bit in the middle there is vaginal stripe, and it's a very good, reliable, regular marker. And in this one, the free fluid is above the bladder, superior to the bladder superficial to the bladder. Now, this is why ectopics are missed. This is a longitudinal view. We can see the bladder on the screen right. 
we pan through it. Now I'm actually going to draw around. That is the uterus, the cervix, the vaginal stripe there. And what we can see extending superiorly in the midfield, we can see extending off to the screen left, is blood clot. And because it's the same. I totally missed that. Sorry? I would have missed that. Yeah, we all do. Because it's the same color as the, the same acoustic impedance as the uterus. And so we don't see any interfaces. It just looks continuous. What's even worse is down here, we've got a black collection. And the reason that's bad is that we shouldn't be seeing fluid down to the sacrum. We shouldn't be able to see the sacrum at the bottom. We should be having rectal gas shadow here, but something's replaced it. So that, that circle down the bottom is where we have the free fluid and we have clot extending up from the uterus. So that's why we tend to look in ectopics at the right upper quadrant and left upper quadrant first, because that's where we see the free fluid, whereas the uterus is often sort of padded out by clots. Uh, hey, oh, Kylie, yeah. Kylie, um, sorry, it's me. I'm back again. Um, do you have any tips for uh, for scanning in the suprapubic zone when a catheter is in? Because I always seem to scan once the catheter has gone in and yeah, just thought and you might have some... Uh, the catheter makes it really, really hard because the bladder will be empty. There'll be a tiny bit of air in the catheter balloon and so it will just look like a gas signal. And essentially, if you can see the bladder, it usually means the catheter is not working very well. The most important thing is that you scan down into the pelvis. You've got to have your probe low enough on the abdomen that you're feeling embarrassed, that you're sort of apologizing. You've got to be on the really low cut bikini line just above the pubic symphysis. So if you're not feeling embarrassed, you're not low enough. The second thing is that you must direct the beam down into the pelvis. So you're looking downwards from the pubic symphysis or towards the butt, I guess you could say. And uh, you to look for urine in the, well, to look, to identify the bladder, sometimes you actually have to jiggle the catheter bag but, and or even um, squirt a little bit of saline into the balloon if you can't identify it and you watch for the movement. But far and away, the most important thing is that people don't get low enough on the abdomen to see it properly. Is that, does that answer your question? Yeah, cool. Yeah. 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 And it's the same with the longitudinal view. You sit the lower edge of the probe on the pubic symphysis, but then you direct the beam um, Cordially, really cordially um, into the pelvis. Anyway, young man from a high velocity MVA. Um, I won't go through the lungs because you're having a hard time seeing them. But what do you think about that M mode there of his right lung? Is that Seashore or Shelley Beach or, or Barcode? Barcode. Yeah, probably. Barcode. Yes, I think so. But with the patient with who's dyspneic, it becomes quite difficult because we can have movement artifact in the intercostal muscles. But you're right, it's barcode. This is his right lung base. Sam, um, we were talking about the uh, spine sign. Yeah. yeah. See how the spine's a lot more distinct? Yeah. Yeah. Now we do have those uh, B lines coming off the diaphragm. So that's actually where the lung tissue is. But this fellow has a small hemothorax. Nice. Thank you. Okay, now this is, what's this sign here on the MO just for, uh, just for exam references? What do you call this sign? Hatton? Okay. Uh, that's a barcode or stem. No. Uh, troposphere. It's not a genuine barcode. You might have to peer at this closely. Oh. oh. Uh, Lung pulse. Yes, that's it. Louise got it. The mm. regular beating. Now, it doesn't mean he's ventilating that lung. It just means that lung's not collapsed. So you could have a right mainstem intubation and still get lung pulse. Uh, now, I did mention how the stomach can, when it's full of fluid, can look like free fluid. And that's what we've got on the screen right here. We're actually looking at the diaphragm at the time, but it shows up on the screen right. 
Um, this is, I couldn't find his kidney, but um, even though we've missed the kidney and accidentally got the gallbladder, Sam, do you think this is a positive or negative left upper quadrant? I think that's positive. I yeah, think it's pretty fluid. You can see it just outside of that gallbladder wall. Yes, and outlining the liver tip. Okay, what about yeah. the picture on the screen right now? That's a better view, but it's a bit weird, isn't it? What do you think of that one? Yeah, it's good. I think that's positive. That, that looks like fluid around the upper part. Oh, no. You shouldn't. Yeah. You said that you shouldn't be able to see free fluid there. Yes. That, so yes. That, that's a normal one. No. <laughs> but ah. the trap for new players. That is retroperitoneal fluid. Oh, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Yeah, okay. yeah. Now, this chap actually had, I think, a chance fracture. And you can see on the CT that sort of most of his blood was actually retroperitoneal. Yeah, right. But um, I, this is a fantastic little uh, diagram from Radio Pia. Yeah, we, no. we talk about the abdominal cavity, and we mostly think about that top uh, cavity in the picture. But we actually have about three other layers of mesentery that can be split or dissected off with fluid. And depending on which cavity is um, being distended with fluid gives you different patterns of the retroperitoneal fluid. So if you, for example, rupture your descending or ascending colon or your pancreas, you'll get tracking of the fluid uh, as in the picture here. If you get a ureter rupture because of obstruction, you'll get fluid that's contained directly just around the kidney. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if you get your aorta, aortic yeah, aneurysm, yeah, yeah. it spreads differently. If we imagine Morrison's pouch mm -hmm. and longitudinal, like we're used to looking for, what I've been saying is that this black area here is where you see free fluid in the intraperitoneal uh, region. But if you see a perinephric abscess or a ruptured ureter, it will collect directly around the kidney like this. But if you see something in one of those other two um, uh, potential spaces, you'll see fluid in this sort of distribution. And in the old days, with those 2006 images, you would never recognize this pattern of fluid. It, you know, the images weren't good enough. But nowadays, we can see even tiny bits of fluid as, as you've seen. And so it's important that you start to recognize when fluid is retroperitoneal. Now here's, a, here's another one. This is just a tiny bit of fluid at the lower pole of the kidney. You see it there sitting on the psoas. I think that's one where the ureter ruptured because of a stone. So that's purely in the renal capsule. You got that one? Is that, can you see it? Yep. Mm -hmm. So, um, the things to know from that case is that the lung pulse excludes the pneumothorax, even though it doesn't mean necessarily ventilating your lung. Start to realize that there is a retroperitoneal compartment that we can see now that we've got better machines. Ah, and one thing I didn't point out, but I'm going to point out now, is that this is free gas in the abdomen. It looks for all the world like a pneumothorax. Um, now, a lot of people try and call free gas in the abdomen, but unless it's over the liver or the spleen, I find it very difficult um, because sometimes distended um, bowel gas can look very bright and shiny just like this. But this particular bit of free gas, it never leaves the abdominal wall. And there's also a sign where you apply probe pressure directly down on the free gas and it moves apart like a curtain or a scissor sign. Um, but in general, I just find it very hard thing to pick unless I can see it above the liver, like in this case. And I think this chap, if I go back, had free gas. Um, no, not that one, not that one, not that one. Ooh, where to go? Sorry, went too fast. Oh, I've missed it. Ah. Oh, never mind. Okay, now we've only got five minutes left. I'm not sure if we've got time for this case. Um, Sam, what would you like to do? I'm afraid so I'm going to have to go to another meeting in a couple of minutes. So maybe can we 
pull up stamps saying to see if anyone's got any questions. Yeah, that's a good idea. Sorry, Kelly, thank no, you. No, 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 this is a long case and I didn't have a chance to time it, so I had no idea if we'd fit this in. Um, I think we've gone through the important bits. Yes, any questions? May I ask one quick question? Have you got any advice to, when you're actually doing this, I sometimes find either I've been trying to lead a, a, a trauma scenario as well as doing the ultrasound, you know, can you just give us some advice on how you think we should be doing, uh, actually doing it in the in real life during the actual scenario? Yes, okay. Uh, first bit of advice is if you've got a really large patient, then I reckon you should use the cardiac probe, the phased array probe. It seems to have better penetrance and you're not worried about the near field ever so much. And it also gives you a nice wide view. So first tip, use cardiac probe if they're big. Second tip, the hardest view of all is the left upper quadrant because the spleen is small and the stomach is often big. So although you might find Morrison's pouch fairly easily, it's a lot harder to find the left upper quadrant. So the advice here is wherever you were on the right side, when you translate to the left side, you're probably going to need to go further north and further to the bed. So move at least one rib space towards the head and at least one rib space towards the bed. And you keep going further to the head, further to bed until you hit the lung. So that left upper quadrant, definitely the hardest. Um, the other thing is that when you have the really large patients, that's 99% of my population here, is that as you go move the probe further towards the bed, you have to compensate and direct the beam anteriorly. So you don't want to be slicing directly parallel to the bed as you move your knuckles to, to scrape the sheets. You want to be actually directing the beam back up to the midline, uh, back up to aiming for the spine, um, which is something people forget because they forget that the patient's internal organs are sort of round, even if their external body habitus is not. Um, that's my main suggestion. And, and Make sure whether you know you're on retrospective or prospective clip save, of course. Um, anything else? That's perfect. Um, were there any other questions for Kylie? Thank you so much, Kylie. That's really amazing. Thank yeah, you. Was a really yeah, that was fantastic been... talk. Thank you. It was clarifying. Yeah, great learning points, Kylie. Thanks. Oh, good. I'm glad. Yeah. Uh, I. I'll happy to do it anytime, Sam. Anyway, Absolutely. everyone have good exams. See you later and please stay masked. And uh, I hope Absolutely. Things okay, thank you very, very much indeed. See you later. Bye-bye. If you learned something, hit like and subscribe to our channel for more videos uploaded weekly. For bite-sized versions, follow us on Twitter at Echo Nepean and check out the tutorials. Or head over to our websites for the latest hands-on courses. Links in the channel banner. And thanks, thanks for, for watching. watching.